Good morning. morning. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church, as it is our distinct pleasure to present to you what at least I refer to as our in-house requiem. And the reason I call it in-house is because I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the libretto has been written by our own Kathleen Cahill and the music composed by our own David Zabriskie. And there's a, um, a special significance somehow when, when it's within our own congregation that can produce such a masterpiece. And it's just a, uh, just a wonderful moment for, for the whole congregation to, to be able to experience this. Just a few rapid announcements. One, please turn off your cell phones. That is going to be really important. And uh, in fact, it wasn't until David reminded me three seconds ago that I still had mine on. So uh, let's turn those off. Also, a reminder that starting next Sunday, we begin our summer schedule, not summer forum quite yet, but the summer schedule, one service to be held at 10 o'clock next Sunday. And the offering will be a little bit different this Sunday rather than the uh, ushers coming to you somehow in the middle of the service. As you exit after the program, the ushers will be at the doors, and if you are so inclined, please uh, give generously if, that is, um, if that's possible. Symbol of light and of knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Before we begin our requiem, I'd like to share with you a very important reading The author is Mark Epstein, who is, I think, quite well known. He is a Zen psychotherapist, and he has um, given lectures from time to time here in Salt Lake City, and he's one one of the tops in his field. The reading is not so much about death and dying as it is about mourning. It's about those who, who remain to suffer and endure the losses of our loved ones. Talking with my 88-year-old mother four and a half years after my father died from a brain tumor, I was surprised to hear her questioning herself. You'd think I'd be over it by now, she said, speaking of the pain of losing my father her husband of almost 60 years. It's been more than four years, and I'm still upset. Well, I'm not sure if I became a psychiatrist because my mother liked to talk to me in this way when I was young, or if she talks to me this way now because I'm a psychiatrist. But I was pleased to have this conversation with her. Grief needs to be talked about. When it is held too privately, it tends to eat away at its own support. Trauma never goes away completely, I responded. It changes, perhaps, softens some with time, but never completely goes away. Now, what makes you think you should be completely over it? I don't think it works that way. There was a palpable sense of relief as my mother considered my opinion. I don't have to feel guilty that I'm not over it, she asked. It took 10 years after my father died, she remembered suddenly, thinking back to her college sweetheart, to his sudden death from a heart condition when she was in her mid-20s, a few years before she met my father. I guess I could give myself a break. 
Now, I never knew about my mother's first husband until I was playing Scrabble one day when I was 10 or 11 and opened her weather-beaten copy of Webster's Dictionary to look up a word. And there, on the inside of the front cover, in her handwriting, was her name inscribed in black ink, only it wasn't her current name and it wasn't her maiden name. It was another unfamiliar name, not Sherry Epstein, but Sherry Steinbeck, an alternative version of my mother, at once entirely familiar in her distinctive hand and utterly alien. What's this, I remember asking her, holding up the faded blue dictionary, and the story came tumbling out. It was rarely spoken of thereafter, at least until my father died half a century later, at which point my mother began to bring it up, this time of her own volition. I'm not sure that the trauma of her first husband's death had ever completely disappeared. It seemed to be surfacing again in the context of my father's death. Trauma is not just the result of major disasters. It does not happen to only some people. An undercurrent of trauma runs through ordinary life, shot through as it is with the poignancy of impermanence. I like to say that if we are not suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, we are suffering from pre-traumatic stress disorder. There is no way to be alive without being conscious of the potential for disaster. One way or another, death and its cousins old age, illness, accidents, separation, loss, hangs over all of us. Nobody is immune. Our world is unstable and unpredictable and operates to a great degree and despite incredible scientific advancement, it operates outside our ability to control it. My response to my mother, that trauma never goes away completely, points to something I've learned through my years as a psychiatrist. In resisting trauma and in defending ourselves from feeling its full impact, we deprive ourselves of its truth. As a therapist, I can testify to how difficult it can be to acknowledge one's distress and to admit one's vulnerability. My mother's knee-jerk reaction, shouldn't, be, shouldn't I be over this by now, is very, very common. In 1969, working with terminally ill patients, the Swiss psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross brought the trauma of death out of the closet with the publication of her groundbreaking work on death and dying. She outlined a five-stage model of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Her work was radical at the time. It made death a normal topic of conversation, but had the inadvertent effect of making people feel, as my mother did, that grief was something to do right. Mourning, however, has no timetable. Grief is not the same for everyone, and it does not always go away. The closest one can find to a consensus about it among today's therapists is the conviction that the healthiest way to deal with trauma is to lean into it rather than trying to keep it at bay. The reflexive rush to normal is counterproductive. In the attempt to fit in, to be normal, the traumatized, traumatized person, and this is most of us, feels estranged. While we are accustomed to thinking of trauma as the inevitable result of a major cataclysm, daily life is filled with endless little traumas. Things break, people hurt our feelings, ticks carry Lyme disease, pets die, friends get sick and even die. 
I was surprised when my mother mentioned that it had taken her 10 years to recover from her first husband's death. That would have made me six or seven, I thought to myself, by the time she began to feel better. My father, while a compassionate physician, had not wanted to deal with that aspect of my mother's history. When she married him, she gave her previous, weddings photo her previous wedding's photographs to her sister to hold for her. I never knew about them or thought to ask about them, but after my father died, my mother was suddenly very open about this hidden period in her life. It had been lying in wait, rarely spoken of for 60 years. My mother was putting herself under the same pressure in dealing with my father's death as she had when her first husband died. The earlier trauma was conditioning the later one, and the difficulties were only getting compounded. The willingness to face traumas, be they large, small, primitive, or fresh, is the key to healing from them. They may never disappear in the way we think they should, but maybe they don't need to. Trauma is an ineradicable aspect of life. We are human as a result of it, not in spite of it. Today we gather in memory of our loved ones, and this Ritual of a requiem is woven into the tradition of this congregation. We honor today, in addition to your personal losses, the nine people whose lives were celebrated by the ministry of this church since the time of our last requiem. And we're also going to honor the person whose memorial is planned for a week from tomorrow, May 30th. So may our minds and hearts recall at this time Justin Creek, Susan Burrell, Merlene Leeming, Alex Miller, Tess Rogers Congdon, Nina Dougherty, Valentina Konstanescu, Paul Hellstrom, Janet Minden, Rand Hart. At this time, I invite you to, to say the names of those who are in your hearts at this time. Just say the names. We struggle with the mystery of death. We may protest its choice of season. We seek the healing which time brings. But our spirits are lifted that our loved ones entered our lives, blessed our days, and live even now in our hearts. Amen.
a sound in the ocean. As I sit here alone on the evening of your death, as the moon curls round the night, I can barely catch my breath, for it seems it was a week ago I met you. so fast a life is like a day the minutes pass like rain the minutes pass like rain an hour ago I turned to you and said my love there's so much life a moment can time in the world 
It was good. It was good. It was good.
does not grow.
I shall fall.